Welcome, my name is Kathy Richards and I'm here on behalf of Anthem EAP to present Maintaining a Healthy Heart. We are gonna spend some time together today looking at the different considerations that help us have a healthier heart, both now and as we age, so that we can look at ways that we can um, maybe make small changes to our lifestyle that would help improve our overall health. While we're here together today, we're gonna to talk about the facts and risk factors related to heart disease and a little bit about the, the numbers and statistics with that, um, which can be kind of, kind of scary, a little bit shocking sometimes. And then what are the lifestyle factors that lead to a healthy heart and how you can recognize the symptoms of a heart attack or a stroke, the, the role of statins and other medications, you know, paying attention to your heart health is one of the best things you can do to improve your overall quality of life, your longevity, your overall health. So we're going to talk, talk about the various terms and factors you need to know um, for better health. So it's going to be hopefully just packed with great information. So here are some of the facts. Now, heart disease is a leading cause of death for both men and women. And we used to think heart disease was just mostly about for men who are impacted, but it's really a lot of women as well. Over 600,000 Americans die every year from heart disease. And coronary heart disease is the most common type of heart disease, and that kills over 370,000 people annually. So there are other kinds of heart disease. Coronary heart disease is uh, when you have blood vessels that deliver blood to your heart that are blocked. That is one of the most common types of heart disease, although there are other, other um, kinds as well. Wow, someone has a heart attack every 40 seconds in the United States, the leading cause of death across most racial and ethnic groups. So again, sometimes we, we think that it's limited more to certain groups than others, but um, it's really it's, it's really not. It's, it's growing in all ethnic groups and all um, um, kind of racial groups. So wow, we want to pay attention to that here. And the costs of coronary heart disease alone are over $200 billion. Yikes. Um, so we know not good for health, not good for business, not good for, for anything really. So what are the risk factors? So this is a rundown of the list factors. We're gonna kind of talk about each one in a little bit more detail as we go through, but some of the risk factors are things that you can control and some are things that you can't. So there's a couple things like family history of heart disease or diabetes that you can't control. So if somebody has a history in their family of heart disease or diabetes, that would make it even more important. A lot of times um, you're more driven to control the things you can control if you have a family history. We used to say that part of the non-modifiable, that was the term uh, risk factors was also being a male. But like I, we said in that last slide, it is growing, growing, growing for women. So women are becoming just as at risk of heart disease as men. So we can no longer say, oh, that's a man's disease. Um, and age is another one that you can't control. Our risk does increase as we age. Um, but when we look at diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure, those are things that are some of the biggies that really put us at risk of heart disease and that can be controlled. Sometimes there are, are you know, that, that can be partially genetic too, but we look at lifestyle factors about how we eat, how we exercise. So physical inactivity is its own separate risk factor for heart disease. Obesity, which of course is related, to activity related to how we eat, although it's a genetic uh, factor there too. Smoking is another one of the significant risk factors. Nicotine damages our blood vessels. And so when nicotine damages our blood vessels and there is more likely for the different fats that are flowing through our bloodstream to get caught in the little nicks along the way and create um, a, a little bulge which, which narrows the artery. So if you ever heard you know, about when we have atherosclerosis where there's a plaque buildup in the arteries, well, that can be caused by high cholesterol and by smoking because smoking damages the blood vessels and makes them more likely to have those little spots that are damaged. Um, we talked about <clears throat> poor nutrition. And then lastly, um, alcohol use is a factor as well. So lots of stuff for us to talk about. When we look at the at the terms, like the actual um, kind of, I was going to say the vocab terms because I teach this class. I teach um, a health health class like this at a community college, and so we're always talking about you know what what are the vocab terms you need to know. So I'm sorry I kind of slid into that mode here for a minute here. So when you look at your lipid panel, like if you have a blood test taken on your annual physical or another doctor's appointment, a lot of times that's what they're calling for. They'll say um, 
that you're going to get a lipid panel. So a lipid panel gives you several measurements of your cholesterol at one time. So it'll tell you what your total cholesterol is. It'll tell you what your HDL, your LDL, the ratio of total to HDL and your triglycerides. So that's like five different cholesterol scores all in your lipid panel. So um, total cholesterol used to be what we almost only tested, like back in the day, years ago, we would do a finger stick, you get your total cholesterol reading. And we always kind of heard you want it to be under 200. And that's still pretty much the general guidelines. However, most of the time now, we don't do the finger stick just to get a general. We, most people get the full blood test where they get the full panel and they find out, hey, what is that total cholesterol made up of? What percent of the total cholesterol is the good kind, which is the HDL, or the bad kind, the LDL? And then what is the ratio of the total to the good kind? Because if your ratio is high, meaning a good percentage of your total cholesterol is the high density of lipoproteins, then you might say, huh, well, maybe my total cholesterol is a bit over 200, but that's because I have so much of the good kind. Then maybe your doctor would say, you don't have to worry about it, okay? Um, triglycerides are literally the fats circulating in the bloodstream that are not linked to a protein. They're just free, fro fully, free floating fats. And a lot of times our triglyceride is more um, present right after eating. And that's one of the reasons why when we get our lipid panel done, they want it to be a fasting measurement, right? Your total cholesterol, all your cholesterol measurements might not change that much based on what you've just eat, eaten, but your triglycerides will not be um, the same right after you eat versus after you fast. And so in order to keep it like measuring apples to apples, like they, wa they want it to be consistent, it's good to have a fasting test. So you know that, that's, um, that you don't have any triglycerides that are, that are elevated just because of what you just ate, that it's more of, a, you know, what in general that you, that you eat. Um, okay, blood pressure is also called hypertension. And so when we look at what blood pressure is, it says that it's a pressure of the blood against your, the inside of your artery walls. And what happens is it's every time your heart beats, right? Every time your heart beats, it's like your, your heart is a, a muscle, but it has a big cavity inside. So it expands, 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 and then it contracts. It squirts all the blood out, right? So every time it contracts and Push, pushes all that blood out, it places a lot of pressure on the artery walls right when the heart is beating. So that's the big number. So a lot of times you've seen that blood pressure is a big number and a slash and a smaller number underneath. So the first number is called the systolic blood pressure. That's the highest pressure it will ever be right when the heart beats. And then in between heartbeats, when the heart is filling again with blood, that's called your diastolic blood pressure. So you have systolic slash diastolic. That's how those numbers are. Um, that's what they mean and what those words mean. Now, the other two things that are important when you're measuring your risk, like if you were going to find out, hey, how at risk am I for heart disease? Well, it's important to know what are my cholesterol numbers? You know, what's my lipid panel? What's my blood pressure? Then what's my BMI and what's my blood glucose? Those are all the metrics that are really super valuable in knowing if you have a high risk for heart disease. So you might have heard the term BMI. So I've been talking at you now a bit without much chatting and going on in the chat. So who knows what BMI is? Have you, how many of you know what your BMI is or have ever had it measured before? And you might know what their BMI is. You don't even really have to measure it these days. A lot of times there's little calculators, like you could type in your height and your weight and it pops back what your, pops out what your BMI is. Now the thing about, good, some of you have done it. Um, the uh, thing about BMI is it was supposed to replace height and weight charts that were that didn't take into account how much muscle you had or you know other factors. And now what do we have here? Just a calculation that is based on height and weight. So, but it does have a range. And so, um, you know, we kind of know if our body weight is in a healthy range. We know that you know what's a little high, what's a little low for BMI. So we'll get to those numbers in a minute. Um, but the other thing that's even more accurate than knowing what your BMI is, is if you have your percent body fat measure. So has anybody had their, ever had the percent body fat measure? There's a couple of different ways to do that. Usually it's measured in a fitness setting, not as much in a doctor's office setting. There's either calipers or there's some things called bioelectrical impedance where you hold a thing and it runs a little current through you. 
Um, so there's different ways to measure percent body fat. Now, percent body fat is even more important to know if somebody is perhaps around an average weight, but it takes into account how much muscle you have on your body compared to how much fat. There are some people who have a higher BMI and a higher body weight than it might then might look to be healthy, but it might be because they have more muscle on their body. And that means that they're not overweight. They're not at an, an, at an extra health risk. So that's something to keep in mind. Blood glucose is a measurement of how much sugar is in your blood. And that is something that we also want to do at a resting level because um, once again, we need to have, we wanna have everybody measured the same way. And if we know what your fasting blood glucose is, then we know, okay, how much blood sugar do you have circulating around even when you haven't just eaten anything? Because right after we eat something, of course our blood sugar is gonna go up. If you ate something particularly sugary, it's gonna be way up. So we don't wanna know your blood sugar level based on what you just ate. We wanna know what it is when you haven't eaten anything, how much at a resting state is still floating around. Because if you have high blood pressure, <laughs> high glucose, high blood sugar, floating through your bloodstream, even when you haven't eaten anything recently, then that's a signal of someone who's a high risk of diabetes. So that's a really important measurement. And you know what? You're not going to have any symptoms for that or for high blood pressure or for high cholesterol. So you would not know if these numbers were out of whack unless you actually had the measures. So that's why um, it can be really valuable to do that. Sometimes when you go to the doctor's office and say, oh, your numbers are normal. Oh, your numbers are high. But, you know, don't be afraid to ask them for more specifics, you know, they might just say, oh, you're good, you don't have to worry. Well, there also is usually what's called a reference range, like they'll, in the, if you get the lab sheet, it'll say the reference range, it'll tell you what's the high and low of the acceptable area. Um, now, for cholesterol, it just showed the numbers up here, total, we, we are shooting for less than 200. HDL, you want it to be higher than 40, but actually, that's pretty generous. A lot of times the recommendations are saying you want it to be higher than 60 these days or 65 in order to be considered really good. Um, LDL, you definitely want under 130 and triglycerides less than 150. So those are good numbers to keep in mind, but you don't have to memorize these or write them down. If you get your, your blood test, it'll be right there on the paper. It'll show you what's good, bad, and ugly for, for those numbers. Now, blood pressure, 120 over 80 is what's normal. And now they're starting to say they want it under that. It used to be around that was considered normal. And you weren't really considered high until it was 130 over 90. But now they're saying, look, they're even considering it elevated if it's somewhere in the 120s. So, wow, huh? Um, and then it says or, and um, less than 80. So they want it to be, um, you know, under 80. And also, if you have it anywhere in the 80s at all, and, and especially anywhere over 130, you're automatically considered stage one hypertension or high blood pressure. Stage two is when it's over 140. And now really crisis is it's like, well, 180. You sometimes, again, you might get a measure of 160. Usually the numbers go up together or go down together. One of the things to keep in mind is that blood pressure varies all day long and every day. So a single high blood pressure reading does not mean you have high blood pressure. Your blood, pre is, blood pressure is going to go up and down all the time. So you want to um, see what the trend is. If you have a high blood pressure reading, your doctor will most likely say, hey, let's keep an eye on this. Let's measure it frequently and see what the trend is. Any questions on this stuff so far? We are looking at what the numbers now are for BMI and for blood glucose so that you would know that a normal BMI is somewhere in the low 20s, high teens to low 20s. When you get in the upper 20s or definitely over 30, that's, that's getting too high for health risk for BMI. And that for glucose, a fasting, we're looking for under 110. Um, so non-fasting says less than 140, but no one wants to do a non-fasting glucose test usually anymore. They, they usually want them to be fasting. Okay, has anyone heard of waist to hip ratio? That is another measurement that is sometimes used. And again, it's more often used in a fitness setting than in a, at a physician's office. But one of the reasons why that can be valuable to know is that we know that for people who carry their weight in their stomach area, they're at a greater risk of heart disease than someone who carries their weight in their hip and thigh area. So you can see by these numbers here that men are given a little bit of an of a edge as far as they're allowed to have a slightly higher 
uh, ratio in order to still be in the healthy range. That's because men predominantly are going to carry their weight in their midsection, right? I mean, you're not men's bodies are not supposed to have their hips bigger than their waist. Um, however, for a woman, you might have heard the terms apple and pear shaped. Like so, genetically, you are either born an apple or a pear, and that's called android or gynoid, or like the the technical terms for that. So whether or not you're at your ideal weight or whether you're underweight or whether you're a little bit overweight or significantly overweight, your general body type is not going to change. You're always going to be an apple. And if you're, if you were born an apple, so if you're an apple and you're at your tiniest weight ever, you might still be one of those people's like, oh, my stomach is still a little pouch here, even though my legs are skinny and I, I still carry a little bit of weight in my tummy. And I don't like that. Whereas someone who's at their ideal weight or even thin and they're a pair, they're going to feel like, well, my waist has always been my good spot, but you know what? My out of outer thighs and my rear end is what, what drives me crazy. So that's kind of what that waist hit ratio means is that um, whether you're whatever weight you are for you, that let's measure your waist to hip ratio so that if your waist is, is bigger compared to your hips, it puts us at um, a greater risk of heart disease because the fat is circulating closer to the heart. So what are some things that we can do to live a healthy heart lifestyle? Well, number one, quit smoking, and that should be a, a, a you know obvious one there. Now, the one thing I want to say about quitting smoking is that it can be really hard. Most people who smoke know that it's not good for them, know they probably should quit, and have maybe even tried to quit in the past and had difficulty. So it's a hard, hard thing to do. And most people who are successful in quitting smoking are not successful the first time, or sometimes the second time, or sometimes the third time. It can take multiple times to finally quit smoking. So we are not looking at um, you know an all or none thing here. So if you are currently a smoker, it will be helpful to just smoke less. It will be helpful for your health to delay a cigarette or to limit the number of cigarettes you let yourself have in a day. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be all or none. Quitting is awesome, but so is smoking less. Now, increasing your physical activity, important also, because we know that inactivity is a link to heart disease. We also know that exercise helps reduce blood pressure, help exercise helps reduce cholesterol, exercise helps teach your muscles to absorb blood sugar out of the bloodstream so it reduces your risk of diabetes. So, I mean, all, I mean, so many ways exercise reduces our heart disease risk from so many ways. It reduces heart disease risk by itself. It also reduces all the risk factors that put us at risk for heart disease. So it's really one of the best things you can do. Next is to add resistance training and weight bearing activities to your exercise. Now, weight bearing just means things that you're standing up. It means that walking or jogging or doing a Zumba class or anything that you're standing is better for heart health than swimming or riding a stationary bicycle or something where you're sitting or, or horizontal, okay? Um, but it's not that this other exercise is bad for you. And then resistance training is weight training. How many of you do weight training? It's one of my favorite things to promote, favorite things to talk up. How many of you are doing weight training exercise? Say yes, 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 yes. Who's doing weight training? Someone started this week, fantastic. And I have a great big yes with exclamation points in all caps. Anybody else? That's two. I got two, I want more. All right, well, if you're not doing strength training, then I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, you will be starting to think that, hey, maybe that's something that will be really good for me to do. One of the things that it does is, once again, it helps teach your muscles how to absorb glucose right out of the bloodstream. It protects our joints. It improves our overall metabolism. It's just fantastic in so many ways. Building our muscle makes us stronger, more independent as we age. Um, the other things to help is obviously learning to reduce or, and manage stress. Stress increases the hormone cortisol, which damages our body. Um, stress also makes our liver produce more cholesterol. Stress also increases our blood pressure. So stress is going to impact a lot of those things. So the more we can do to manage our stress, we're going to be able to reduce our risk of heart disease. And getting enough sleep. Whew. All of these things, you know what? None of these things are new, are they? None of these things are things we haven't heard before. The difference quite often is, is, are we able to take this stuff to heart? Are we actually able to do it and figure out how we can fit this into our lives? 
So what about diet and nutrition? Now we know that we should be eating quote unquote, a well-balanced diet. What does that mean? We mostly know that that means um, having more whole foods, more natural foods, less processed foods, less things with sugar or processed sugar, um, more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, more lean proteins. So we're just supposed to be reducing the things that come in prepackaged wrappers, correct? eating smaller meals, smaller frequent meals, so that we're not having a whole lot at one sitting that our body can't digest and process. And then when we reduce our saturated fat intake, then that also reduces our, it helps reduce our cholesterol. Um, so mostly saturated fats, or not mostly, 100% saturated fats are in meat and, da and dairy. So eating a more plant, based diet, sometimes called plant forward. You don't have to be full on vegan, but just trying to have more plants and less meat and dairy in your life. Typically people are healthier and have a healthier heart. And reducing sodium intake can be important for keeping our blood pressure in a healthy range. So that's why that can be helpful also, since we know that blood pressure is a risk. Now let's look at recognizing a heart attack. So what does a heart attack feel like when you're having one? Because you don't wanna like be having a heart attack and say, oh, it's probably nothing. Because really taking note of the symptoms when they're happening is gonna be one of the best ways that you can protect your health and not to think, oh, it's probably nothing. And, and we, don't, we don't want you to do that. We want people, if they're experiencing symptoms to actually act on them and, and not think, oh, I'm feeling silly. I don't feel self-conscious if it was nothing, no. Um, but one of the things that you want to do is also think, do I have some of the other risk factors? Am I a prime candidate for a heart attack? So look at these things. Someone can be nauseous or vomiting or be short of breath or break out in a cold sweat just because you have the flu. But if you have some of these and you're over 55 and you're overweight and you have high cholesterol and you're a smoker, you know what I mean? You start, need to start looking at your overall risk profile. Um, but the top two are the biggies that are really specific of heart attacks, where discomfort or pressure in the center of the chest. Some people describe it as feeling like someone's sitting on your chest, or the, the pain might be radiating down your arm, up your jaw and neck, down your back. So it can be radiating pain, and then sometimes it's accompanied for, by some of those other feelings as well. Now, the symptoms for women are slightly different. And that's what we want to actually put like a little flashlight on because we used to only have more research on what men's symptoms were. And now that we know that women um, have different symptoms, it's important to get that word out so that you don't ignore it. Now, women often feel intuitively like something is wrong, but do they act on it? That's the thing. Are we gonna act on it? And we want to, again, if you are of a certain age and you have certain other risk factors and you start feeling any of these things, it's good to check it out. You don't wanna, you, it better be safe than sorry. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it really is. You, if you're having a heart attack, you wanna know it. So um, they're less common to get the nausea, vomiting, and jaw pain, but they're more likely to have the shortness of breath and to feel it in their back, believe it or not. So it's a little bit different. Now we wanted to talk about stroke also because a stroke is sometimes they call it like a brain attack. So if a heart attack is when you don't have enough uh, oxygen and blood flow to the heart, a stroke is a brain attack where a, a part of the brain is dying from lack of blood in one of the arteries that normally supplies the, the blood um, to the brain. So um, because a heart attack is when the coronary arteries, the, the little arteries that supply blood to the heart itself get blocked, so we also have blood vessels supplying blood to the brain and if one of those gets blocked, then that is a stroke. We can have a mini stroke, we can have just a medium sized stroke and we can have a massive stroke and people can die from a massive stroke. They can just, you know, can die just like you can die from a heart attack. You can also have small strokes that someone barely notices that they have. So, um, but if you ever witness somebody having a stroke, you will probably see that something looks off. And what's really important is if you suspect someone you know of having a stroke, go ahead and seek medical attention right away. Time is of the essence. You want to act quickly. So one of the things, some of the things to look for is a sudden numbness or weakness in the face, arm, or leg, especially one side. Like sometimes, you know, it's a drooping or change, like one side, the face looks different. Um, and, or they might have so some kind of confusion. They might be trying to say something, but the words are garbled. They're just, they're words, but they're not full sentences or they're not real words. 
they just have trouble communicating. They might be have blurriness in one or both eyes. They might be dizzy. They're like can't quite walk. They have a, might have a severe headache and don't know why. So um, has anybody ever been in presence of somebody who's had a stroke? Because I'm going to tell you about a time that I had someone come to my office who was having a stroke and I had to call 911 right away. And I'm so glad I recognized it. Uh, and it was not, it was, it was pretty easy to recognize, but sometimes it's more subtle. So what I, what happened to me is that I was working in a senior living community as a director of wellness for a senior living average age, there was 85 and a, a gentleman walked past my office. He poked his head in my door and he kind of just stood there and I said, hi, can I help you? And he said like four or five words that did not make a sentence. It was just like, didn't make any sense at all. And he just, he just looked. He's just staring off the space. He just wasn't there. And I was like, oh, okay, Let's have a seat, sir. And I just got right on the phone and they came right away. And um, that's how, you know, the, the time is, the time is, is really important, very quickly getting action. So what are statins? Statins are a drug that lower your LDLs. So that's kind of like if someone says they're on, um, cholesterol medication it is usually a statin. And so um, that is something that can sometimes have side effects like nausea, constipation, depression. Um, and that can, can be when your cholesterol levels are too low. So we don't want them too high, but we don't want them too low either. So there's kind of like a, I guess a little a happy place there, right? And so um, they are also something that are really hard on the liver. So if you have some type of liver disease, your doctor is not going to recommend a statin for you. But this is a decision that you are going to make with your physician. No one's going to you know, make the decision on their own whether they're going to be on a statin or not. But there has also been really much improved drug information since back in the 80s when statins were like just prescribed all the time, like some type of miracle drug. And now we know that you can't just get on a cholesterol medication and that's the end. You also need to have lifestyle change. Um, really important to be able to um, do that. Someone asks, is it true that statin drugs can cause dementia or Alzheimer's? You know, I do not know. I apologize. I'd have to look that up. I'm sure that a quick Google search away. If you've heard that, then it's probably something that there is suspicion about, that there could be a link. But sometimes the link has not been proven, you know, 100%. Um, so it's something to be, you know, to, to be conscious of and to talk to your physician about, yeah. Because um, if your cholesterol is high enough that your doctor wants to consider medication, then you would want to talk about what are the other diseases that are either you have a history of or your family has this job, like as I did, because my mom, has is dement has dementia like a moderate level of dementia so if she were to be if her doctor would want to put her on a cholesterol medication we would have to wonder if they, we, that would be something that they would want to need to take into account um versus just um you know say, oh let's just go on a cholesterol medication you're right so that's good that's a good thing for for people to to consider okay so here's a little summary of the, all the things, the health habits that are going to help lead us to reducing our risk of heart disease. So we talked about blood pressure, right? And how both exercise helps control blood pressure, so does eating a low sodium diet, um, moving around in general. We know that we can lower our cholesterol through reducing our stress, through eating healthier. We can increase the good kind of cholesterol through exercise. Um, we can quit smoking or we can smoke less. Yes. And then getting sufficient exercise, both in cardio exercise, but also strength training exercise, eating a healthy diet overall, because that's going to impact our cholesterol. It's going to impact our weight, which is the next one, managing our weight. The thing about managing our weight is, again, it's not all or none. A lot of times, part of our American culture is all or none with our eating habits, with our exercise habits, with our weight habits. Either we're drawing all caution to the wind or we're being really restrictive. Does anybody have think they can identify with that, like either being all or none with like really being on track for your habits or really just not even doing anything at all for them. And we tend to get off track. And then when we get off track, we have a really hard time getting back on track. Someone says, if I mess up, I give up. Yeah, oh, that's really frustrating, isn't it? So much better to think about the whole mindset part. Some of the seminars that I do for Anthem have to do with mindset and thinking positively and you know to, when when we think 
positively and when we set ourselves up for success, like thinking about one or two small changes, I can still see myself doing a year from now versus trying to go all or none. And then you do something, you're trying to do something that's too strict, too big of a change. You can't stick to it. So of course you stop and fall off the wagon because who could stick to something that strict anyway? And then you get annoyed with yourself that you stopped. And then when you're so you know, down on yourself for messing up, are you going to reach for a salad after that or no, you're going to do, you're going to com comfort yourself in, in, a, in a bowl of ice cream, aren't you? You know, so I mean, it just becomes this spiral, this downward spiral. So we want to give ourselves a little bit of a break. Look at the small changes that can be long term habits that can help us. Um, and so, yeah, so practicing effective stress management techniques, all of these things um, are are, are you like that? You guys, somebody liked my ice cream ever salad. I know. I mean, I've got pop tarts in the cabinet. I've got teenagers in the house, and I have gotten into the pop tarts after a particularly stressful conversation. And I am like, why did I do that? And I have a little sticky. Where is my little sticky? I have a little sticky that I try to see. Obviously, I'm not looking at it very much. I have a little sticky that says, "Eating on plan is a high," and it's usually right down here. <laughs> ah, it is right here. See. It says eating on plan is a high. I like little little um, kind of visual cues and they help me. So um, rather than thinking about comfort food, I don't like to think about comfort food as much as, you know, I feel great when I'm eating on plan. And it doesn't mean I can never have treats. It just means that one, one treat's not supposed to lead to eight. <laughs> okay, that's the main thing. Um, so yeah, so what I wanna think about here is how many of you have some type of idea of a commitment that you could make to changing one small thing that would reduce your risk of heart disease? Are you willing to write it down, either on a little sticky note for just yourself or verbally say it to somebody else in your life to hold you accountable or type it in the chat? Because accountability matters. Like one of the things that happens to us is that for our work, or for things that we need to do for our family, we have somebody who's who's holding you accountable. I mean, somebody at work is going to care whether you do the work or not. Yeah, right. It's going to come back at you one way or the other. If you don't make dinner for the family, it's they're gonna they're gonna um, you know people will start squawking. Right. I mean, things happen when we don't do stuff that we're supposed to do that someone else is counting on. But when it comes to changing our health habits. Nobody else cares, do they? Not really, I mean, they care, but they're not gonna say, hey, did you, someone just typed into the chat, I'm gonna drink more water, that's a great goal. How about getting more specific, okay? Smart goals, I'll take a sip while I say this, right? Who's heard the acronym SMART goals? That we're, our best goals, we're most successful when we're with our goals, when they are smart, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time bound. So instead of saying, I want to drink more water, how about I'm going to fill up my water bottle? Like I try to drink this whole water bottle right in the beginning of the morning. First thing in the morning, I drink a whole one and then I fill it back up and then I try to empty it again. This is my second water bottle and I've gotten this far down on my second one of the day. That's not, I, I just, well, good gosh, look, it's going to be five o'clock. I like to finish the second one by five ish and then I fill it up again around dinner. And then I, and I don't usually finish the third one, but through dinner and through the evening, I have that third one. That's my goal for water. And rather than just saying, I'm gonna drink more, like someone else typed in, I'm gonna share with a coworker to keep me on track to walk 15 minutes during a break. How many days of the week? It'd be good to say which days of the week, right? Um, is it every day? Is it just Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Is it, you know, the more specific we can get, the better. So you guys are on the right track. Oh, every work day, good for you. Who else has a SMART goal they want to set or type into the chat? Think about one tiny thing. You don't, you don't have to type in the chat. I'm just inviting you to. But think about how you might want to hold yourself accountable for that. Now, we do have some resources available for you. There are great websites that can help you with um, you know, finding out more information. The heart, um, lung, the diabetes, all these, all the specific uh, nonprofits have their uh, websites. Choosemyplate.gov. It's another great website that talks about healthy eating and how to plan out what's what, what would be great to be on your plate for a healthy meal. And I also want to draw your attention to your EAP program because I am here on behalf of your EAP program that's provided by Anthem. And looky there, you have your 800 number, you have your website with your login ID right there. I encourage you to jot that down. 
And the reason why I'm encouraging you to jot it down is that your company is paying for it anyway. You, you, your employer is paying good money to have an EAP program. And guess what the average utilization is for EAP programs? It's not very high. They're paying for it anyway, so you should use it. Look at all the things they have to offer you. Look at all the fantastic things. Face-to-face -face counseling sessions, well, not right now. It's probably Zoom counseling sessions right now, but they're just as good, or phone counseling. Legal and financial consultations, child care, elder care consultations, and referrals. I just did a seminar, actually, I've been doing almost one a week, called Caring for Elders. Some of you might be in the position, I'm caring for my parents right now. I'm, both of my parents are 82. My mom has dementia. My dad has a heart pump. They need care. My siblings and I take turns every day. Well, if I was working for somewhere that had um, that full time that had EAP, I could call them up and, and, and they could point me in the direction of maybe respite care. Okay, if I wanted to bring somebody in to help me with my parents one day a week. If you need child care, care help, ID theft recovery, um, a toolkit on depression. I mean, all kinds of things, free counseling. Yes, this is great information and it's free and it's anonymous. Nobody knows when you call. Your employer will never know that you called and contacted them. All they will get back is an aggregate report. So why do they provide this? Because they know that your health is important and that they want you to be healthy and happy, first of all. Of course, they care about you. But secondly, aren't you going to be able to, to, to be better productive on the job if you don't have a slew of personal problems that you haven't been able to, to have time to get help for, right? So they want to make it easy for you. They want to facilitate having resources available for you to take care of the things you need to take care of because you're not a robot. You're a real person with a real life on the outside of work and you need help. We all need help. And so when you have help for these kinds of issues, you're gonna, you're, you're just going to be better overall. Your health is going to be better. Your, your work productivity is going to be better. You're going to be absent from work less often because you're going to be able to take care of the things that matter in your life. Right? So we want you to take care of us. We want you to take advantage of that. So please do take advantage. So here's again, the 800 number, the website, the login for your um, EAP program. So check it out, just scroll around there and see what they have to offer. So who has any questions now as we wrap up our time together today? You have any specific questions about, about heart disease risk factors um, or your own health habits? Any questions? Questions, questions. No, I'm okay waiting in a little minute here while you think. Sometimes it takes a minute or so to think of any questions. Okay, okay, okay. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right there. Well, on that note, then we will wrap up. Oh, someone just asked, people are doing keto. What do I think about keto? Yeah, keto is all the rage now, isn't it? Uh, my personal opinion is I don't like it. I'm a more long-term, no fad kind of person. That's usually what I recommend for my clients. Any diet will make you lose weight if you reduce what you're eating overall. And normally all of the different fad diets that lop off a whole category of food, you will definitely lose weight because you're reducing your choices. So you will you will lose weight. Um, there is some evidence that reducing your carbohydrate intake makes your body work harder to transfer the protein into energy. And that's one of the reasons why keto sometimes can help speed up weight loss. However, it is pretty stressful on your kidneys. Protein is not meant to be a fuel source. Protein is meant to build muscle and to help metabolic processes in your body. It's not meant to be a fuel source. So when you're depriving your body of enough carbohydrate and forcing it to break down protein for actual fuel, you are putting your body into that state of ketosis, which is not a good state. Your body's not supposed to be in ketosis, but you will lose weight in the state of ketosis. But is it good for your long-term health? Not really. Is it necessary to lose weight? Not really. So... I mean, I'm kind of an old school person. I, I, for my clients, I like slow and steady wins the race, a couple of small changes. My best tip for weight loss is actually um, using an app like MyFitnessPal. I'll type that into the chat in case someone can understand exactly what I'm saying. MyFitnessPal.com. 
that's a website. There's other similar websites that you can track. Oh, someone says, I use my food stuff. It's a free app, free website where you can track your food. And you can also sync it to like a Fitbit. Anyone use a Fitbit or an Apple Watch pedometer. So if you're tracking how much you're moving, how much you're eating, first of all, if you've never tracked your food and you start tracking your food, you don't even have to change what you're eating. Your eyeballs are going to go open, like all get out to say, oh my gosh, that's how what I am eating is adding up. That's how it's stacking up. I, I had no idea. And you'll start changing it just because you feel like you'll start thinking, gosh, is that worth it? Do I really want to eat this? If that's the way it adds up to. So I love food tracking. And then I love making small changes that you can still see yourself doing a year from now and then watch the weight just slowly go down. This just the, the all or none quick fix stuff doesn't usually work. Okay. So I really appreciate that question. It was a great question. Anything else before I sign off? Any other questions before we sign off? Okay, well, uh, you are very welcome. I'm very happy to have been here. So I wish all of you good health. I wish you a great rest of your day. And I hopefully maybe I'll be back sometime. So uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>